This is you. And in front of you lies an urn with six balls in it, three red ones and three blue ones. This setup should look familiar to anyone who's dabbled with probability before. If we draw a ball from the urn at random, then since the number of red balls is the same as the number of blue ones, then there must be a 50% chance of drawing a ball of either color. If we draw three different balls from the urn at random, then the probability that all three of them share the same color is a lot less likely. 10% to be more specific. This is all basic probability theory, and to put it simply, there isn't a whole lot we can do with the given setup. So let's make things a bit more interesting here. We'll set up the scenario in the exact same way, except this time, a randomly selected ball from the urn, which of course could be either red or blue, will be permanently removed without its color being revealed to anyone. And now, whether you like it or not, you and I are going to play a game with the five remaining balls in this urn. On either of our turns, we may draw a ball from the urn at random, note down the color of the ball, and then put it back into the urn. And we're allowed to do this as many times as we'd like. The goal is to gather enough information as we can through this process to be able to confidently predict the color of the ball that was removed from the urn. Our trials will be conducted separately, without either of us having any knowledge about the other person's results. The player that makes an accurate prediction with fewer total draws wins the game. Now, coming up with a strategy and figuring out the optimal number of draws needed to maximize your chances of winning this game is definitely a worthwhile thought experiment. But that isn't what this video is about. Instead, I want you to consider the following hypothetical game played out between the two of us and the problem that comes along with it. I promise it'll be worth going through. And who knows, it might even challenge your intuition when it comes to solving problems related to probability. All right, on your turn, the first ball you draw is a red one. The second ball is also red. And so is the third and the fourth, and the fifth, and yep, yeah, the sixth. That's right, you end up drawing six red balls in a row, and at this point, you decide to call it. The ball that was removed from the urn must have been a blue one. Now, on my turn, since I've got a lot of time on my hands and nothing better to do with my life, I decide to draw a lot more balls, 600 to be exact. I obviously do this because I'm a numbers guy, believing that the more data I have under my belt, the more foolproof my prediction will be. And out of these 600 draws, 303 of them end up being a red ball, while the other 297 a blue ball. Since I drew more red balls than blue ones, then I also predict that the ball that was removed from the urn was a blue one. Now, both of our trials tend to lean towards the same conclusion. And sure, it's likely the case that we're both correct on our predictions. However, I'm not really concerned about the color of the removed ball. The more interesting question I'd like to ask is, which one of us, if either, has the stronger empirical evidence to back up their claim? That is, whose results are more mathematically convincing when paired alongside their prediction? Here's your chance to pause the video if you'd like to think about it some more before we discuss the solution together. Okay, before we do anything rigorous, let's get a few details out of the way first. Right off the bat, we know that the removed ball could be either red or blue, with both possibilities being equally likely. Which means that each of these sample pools has an equal likelihood of being the one that we're drawing from, with one involving three red balls and two blue ones, and the other involving two red balls and three blue ones. So, regardless of how many balls we decide to draw from the urn, the smart move would be to base our prediction on the color that appears less often. And that's because this discrepancy hints at which sample pool we're likely drawing from. So, yeah, it makes sense that we both ended up guessing blue, since we both drew more red balls than blue ones. Meaning we're both on the right track as far as evidence is concerned. Okay, now let's try to figure out whose data is more convincing between the two of us. At first glance, it may seem as though you have the more compelling evidence here. I mean, 0% of your balls were blue ones, as opposed to my 49.5%. But is this really a fair comparison, though? With a small sample size like yours, percentages tend to be more sensitive, often leading to exaggerated or sometimes even misleading results. How about instead we compare our data to the expected number of red and blue balls drawn and see who came closer? If we go with the assumption that the removed ball was a blue one, then roughly 60% of our draws should be red and the remaining 40% blue. Which means that out of 6 draws, the expected count should be about 4 red balls and 2 blue ones. Now, sure, this doesn't exactly align with your data, but the fact that you drew fewer blue balls than expected makes it even more likely that the removed ball was a blue one. So, technically, your results exceeded expectations. On the other hand, after drawing 600 balls, we should expect to see about 360 red ones and 240 blue ones. To get a better idea of what's going on, let's take a look at the normal distribution curve for the expected number of blue balls after 600 draws. 
And again, just as a reminder, this is under the assumption that the removed ball was a blue one. Notice that the mean is centered at 240. This implies that getting anything more than 240 will actually work against the claim that the removed ball was blue. The further we go out, the less plausible our claim becomes. Whereas getting anything less than 240 in the opposite direction will help strengthen the claim that the removed ball was blue. And, well, here's where I ended up, all the way to the right. Not only am I nowhere near the expected value, but I'm also on the side of the curve that works against my claim. Alright, that should settle it then. You possess the stronger evidence out of the two of us, right? Well, not really. Unfortunately for you, what we just showed is inconclusive. Even with you drawing no blue balls, and me drawing a lot more blue balls than expected, that's still not enough to prove that your data is better than mine. Which begs the question, how do we even measure the strength of evidence? Well, by definition, evidence is something that provides grounds for deciding whether something is true or not. The stronger the evidence is, the more likely the claim we're trying to prove is true, where the underlying claim in our case is that the removed ball was a blue one. So, in order to assess how strong our evidence is, what we're really trying to figure out is how probable this claim is, given the data that was collected by each of us. In other words, for you it would be, what is the probability that the removed ball was blue, given that 6 out of 6 balls drawn were red? And similarly, for me it would be, what is the probability that the removed ball was blue, given that out of 600 balls drawn, 303 were red and 297 were blue? Let's start off with yours first. Notice that we immediately run into an issue if we try to use the formal definition of conditional probability. Since, well, we can't determine the probability of drawing 6 red balls without knowing which sample pool we're drawing from. So instead, we'll need to use good old Bayes' theorem, which gives us an out for calculating conditional probabilities like ours. And here we have our equation. Don't worry if this looks intimidating, let's just work through it one piece at a time. We already know that the removed ball is just as likely to be red as it is to be blue, with a 1 over 2 chance. So these factors just cancel out nicely. And we can simplify whatever's left like so. Now all we need to do is figure out the probability of drawing 6 red balls under each of the two possible sample pools. If we know the removed ball was a red one, then the urn we're drawing from must contain 2 red balls and 3 blue ones, meaning the probability of drawing a red ball is equal to 2 over 5. And so the probability of drawing 6 red balls in a row must be 2 over 5 to the power of 6. And similarly, if the removed ball was a blue one, then the probability of drawing a red ball is equal to 3 over 5. And so the probability of drawing 6 red balls in a row must be equal to 3 over 5 to the power of 6. After plugging everything back in, we can see that the probability that your prediction is correct based on the evidence you gathered comes out to 91.9%. Yep, that's pretty good. Now, let's switch over to my end to see how well I did. Just like with your equation, this whole thing simplifies pretty nicely to the following. Okay, now let's take a closer look at these conditional probabilities. This time round, we can just use the binomial distribution to calculate the likelihood of getting 303 red balls and 297 blue ones under both sample pools. And after plugging all this back in, we can see that the probability that my prediction is correct based on the evidence I gathered comes out to, uh, 91.9%. Yep, that's not a typo or a coincidence. Our values are identical. And so the evidence on both ends is in fact equally strong. Okay, okay, that's nice and all, and I'm so happy for us, but how is this even possible, given everything we've shown up to this point? Well, before we discuss how our values ended up being identical, let's address the elephant in the room. How on earth did I manage to get such a high value when my ratio of red balls to blue balls was almost exactly split down the middle? I mean, if the removed ball was in fact a blue one, then the probability of drawing 303 red balls and 297 blue ones is incredibly low. Like, one in almost two million kinda low. So, what gives? Well, how about we consider things in relative terms? Because while, sure, it is very unlikely to get a 303 to 297 split under the assumption that the removed ball was a blue one, it's even more unlikely under the assumption that the removed ball was a red one. Like, more than 10 times more unlikely. So, yeah, in absolute terms, getting 303 red balls and 297 blue ones is very unlikely under both assumptions. But in relative terms, it's still much more compatible with the hypothesis that the removed ball was a blue one. Okay, cool. Now on to the more interesting question. How did we both end up with the same exact value? And, well, there's one key detail that ultimately turned out to be the deciding factor, hiding in plain sight. Something shared between both sets of data that some of you might have already noticed much earlier. The difference between the number of red balls and blue balls drawn was the same for both of us. And, yeah, that's it. That's all it came down to. Believe it or not, this difference is exactly what the reliability of evidence hinges on where the larger the difference is, the stronger the evidence. 
And surprisingly, the number of balls drawn, or the sample size, didn't end up mattering in the end. But why is that? How can so many of my draws just go to waste without adding anything of value? Well, to see why this difference makes all the difference, no pun intended, we need to understand why everything else is irrelevant. See, this difference is what's called the signal strength, which is just the fancy term for the effective count within a set of data points, meaning it's the only thing that needs to be considered when analyzing the strength of data. In our case, since the signal strength is the difference between the number of red and blue balls drawn, then this value must represent how many more balls there are of one color than the other. Meaning, all the balls outside of this difference, if there are any, must be evenly split between red and blue. And herein lies the reason why this information holds no value. Imagine drawing your first ball from the urn, and it's a blue one. You're probably thinking, okay, cool, it's likely that there are more blue balls in the urn than red ones. In other words, the draw was a useful one, providing a tiny bit of insight about the possible color of the removed ball. Now, imagine for your second draw, you get a red ball. Well, now you've drawn one red ball and one blue one, and together, this information reveals nothing about what the balls in the urn look like, essentially taking you back to square one. And the same can be said if you drew two red balls and two blue ones, or three red balls and three blue ones. In fact, no matter how many balls we end up drawing, we can group every pair of opposite colored balls together and they'll essentially cancel each other out, leaving behind the data that actually matters, the signal strength. Okay, okay, I have something to admit. I don't want you to walk away from this video thinking sample size has no role to play, while signal strength is the end-all be-all. Because the truth of the matter is that they're both important. See, the problem we just discussed was intentionally set up in a way that undermines how significant the sample size can be. Recall that if we assume the removed ball was a blue one, then after drawing 600 balls from the urn, the expected count should be about 360 red balls and 240 blue ones. This would imply an expected signal strength of 120, a value much greater than what I ended up with. Whereas after drawing 6 balls, the expected signal strength is only 2. So I guess you can say you just got lucky. Or I just got really, really unlucky. Here's a quick simulation I ran drawing 1000 balls from the urn. You can clearly see the two lines diverging from each other with the more balls we draw. The magnitude of the vertical distance between these two lines highlights the signal strength after each draw. So yeah, in theory, the larger the sample size, the stronger the signal strength should be. Meaning they're directly proportional to one another. Okay, I want to hear from you now. The game that was played at the beginning of this video was won by you, since you made the correct prediction with fewer balls drawn. Or, I guess we could have both been wrong, since there was an 8.1% chance that the missing ball was actually red. In any case, how many balls would you consider drawing before making a prediction of your own? Leave your thoughts and ideas in the comments below, and if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like, it really helps the channel out a lot. And subscribe if you haven't already, for the many more math puzzles coming very soon.